major issue or a minor. They turn immediately to the people they trust and care about to talk over their problems and seek support. But I was never like that. My first instinct when I'm facing a problem is not to go to my friends or family, but to go to my room, sit quietly, and try to work through the problem myself. But in the past year, that's changed. A few days into my March break last year, my mom drove to my dad's work and demanded he go to the hospital with her. My dad had been feeling poorly for months. It started with a sharp pain in his rib cage, which he assumed was a pulled muscle. But the pain didn't go away. Finally, he went to the doctor, who realized that the pain was caused by my dad's spleen. It was enlarged and would eventually have to be removed. They set a date for the operation, but after speaking with the surgeon, my mom decided it would be best to get him to the hospital as soon as possible. In spite of my dad's loud protestations about being Shanghai, it turned out my mom's instinct was right. My dad's spleen was far larger than the doctors had realized and was caving in part of his lung. They moved the surgery to the very next day. The operation dragged out for several long, anxious hours as my mom and I waited in my dad's hospital room. But eventually it was over with no complications. It had been exhausting, but now all my dad had to do was rest for a few days. But a couple days later, just before my dad was about to go home from the hospital, my mom asked me to wait behind in his room before we left to go out to lunch with visiting relatives. She hesitated. Then she told me that the doctors had found out why my dad needed this operation in the first place. He had lymphoma, a blood cancer. I recognized the word, but only from one place. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, which we had supported since my grandmother died of leukemia four years before. I didn't know what lymphoma was exactly, but I knew it was closely related to the disease that had killed my grandmother. And my father had it. My parents seemed to be waiting for some kind of reaction from me. I nodded, let them tell me what the plan was for his treatment, and then we went out to lunch. Days passed. My dad came home from the hospital. March break ended. I went back to school. He started his chemotherapy. I was half expecting to have some kind of breakdown, but for weeks, I didn't. It seemed like I would be fine. I remember the moment that it hit me very clearly. We were walking into assembly a few days, weeks after the term started. There were little sticky notes of different colors on some of the chairs, so of course we all avoided those chairs like the plague. During announcements, a few students went up to talk about a plan to raise money for cancer research, and explained that the sticky notes represented different kinds of cancer. Every year, they said, over 500,000 people in the U.S. died from cancer. After that, I stopped hearing what they were saying. I could only hear that number repeating over and over in my head. For the rest of the day, I felt dizzy and disoriented, unable to focus on anything. After that, it came in waves. I could go days without thinking much about it, and then suddenly, I would spend one in a total haze unable to think about anything but my dad. Each time it hit me, I felt more overwhelmed. One day, late in the term, I came home at 10.30 at night. I had had my AP U.S. History exam in the morning and mock prefect duty in the evening. I was full of things to tell my parents. But when I walked into the house, my dad, the early bird, who woke up at 5.45 in the morning and never went to bed later than 9.30, was wide awake and washing dishes, full of energy. He had had a session of chemotherapy that morning, and the steroids were still pumping through his system. His hair was almost gone from all the treatments. He tried to talk to me about my day, but I could hardly hear what he was saying over how surreal everything felt. I had been eager to talk, but now all I wanted to do was run up to my room and cry. All this, on top of the normal stress and chaos of fifth form year spring term. I discovered very quickly 
that I couldn't rely on myself the way I was used to. There was nothing left to rely on. All of my energy was consumed by the busy insanity of my life. But there was always something keeping me from a breakdown. The generosity of others and the strength of my relationships. I was astonished by how much the little things suddenly meant to me. A card of sympathy from a distant relative, well-wishing from a teacher, a friend asking how my dad was doing. Every time something like that happened, I felt buoyed, lifted, and for a moment, it was like something had broken through the dizzy fog of my life. And the moments when I felt the most stable, the most normal, were when I was with my friends. We weren't doing anything different or special. We studied and gossiped and goofed around, just as we had been for years. But suddenly that dose of normalcy was everything. My friends didn't have to go out of their way to be supportive of me, though they often did. They just had to be there, being smart and funny and kind, just as they'd always been. My world felt new and confusing, but they kept me feeling stable and sane. Gradually, I began to understand that this time, I couldn't do it on my own. I needed to rely on friends. Late in that term, I was interviewing for the prefectship at Manor House, and Miss Gundy asked me what accomplishment I was most proud of during my years at the Abbey. I opened my mouth, ready to give my normal, canned response, my grades. But I stopped as I realized that that simply wasn't true. And instead I told her that my proudest achievement was the bonds I formed with my friends, with the wonderful people who helped me through such a difficult time just by being themselves. My dad has officially been in remission for a month now, and things are getting back to normal. But I'm never going to forget what I realized over those long months. I know that to many of you this lesson will seem obvious. Many of you already know the importance of relying on friends in difficult times. But I'm sure that some of you out there are like me, inclined to be independent, to rely on others only as a last resort. And so it's really to those people that I'm saying, not everything can be handled alone, but not everything needs to be handled alone. There is strength in the relationships you have formed. And when you most need it, you will have people to rely on. Thank you.